Jerry Seinfeld just uh, decided to speak out and join the anti-woke bandwagon. At least that's what I'm calling it. He says that comedy is being killed by the extreme left and PC crap and people worrying about offending other people. You took issue with the term PC crap. It's too boomer. Look, I don't take issue with the term PC. I just found it telling that he's using it because he's 70 years old and nice timing talking about how the left is killing comedy in 2024 Mm -hmm. when other people already started fixing that issue for you but whatever i do believe anti-woke is officially a bandwagon because we were even talking about what was peak woke yesterday Mm -hmm. we know that peak woke happened because it's it's been you know on the down slide like it, it has been on the decline it's falling out of popularity now Mm -hmm. and finally as wokeness is falling out of popularity then people feel safe to start making comments about how they never liked wokeness they were always anti-woke but they just couldn't tell anyone um and i just find that really annoying so he said this in an interview with the new yorker and it started because they asked him what he was doing during the pandemic right now by the way he is promoting a pop tart movie called unfrosted his first director his first time directing yes um i mean i am excited to see unfrosted but let's go into the interview um he I said do, he i do just... believe there's comments of him talking about this years ago about how comedy is hurt by this type of stuff so i don't think it's just now but i i don't know yeah. um but yeah he said um on Zoom, they started having meetings about Unfrosted, <laughs> and uh, they would do a 20-minute warm-up, small talk. You just start laughing and having fun, and this is how comedy is done. You can't have anybody in the room who doesn't have the same brain disaffection. And they asked him, what does that mean? He said, regular people need courtesies and respect to converse and socialize with them. You can't say hostile things to them to their face, but comedians love that. And they asked, you don't get offended? He said, the offense is if it wasn't funny. That's the offense. Mm. Um, And then he said, the other person is never offended if you insult them, rag on them or something. And he said, as long as it's funny, which usually insulting someone to their face is pretty funny. But we don't think that there is much value in everything else in life. Everything else in life is pretty much a nuisance. But if you can get a laugh out of it, it's worth it. That's the way you go through life. You only care about laughing and being funny. Um, So clearly he thinks people need to have thicker skin these days, Mm -hmm. which isn't the first time I've heard that. Right? Correct. There's a problem with sensitivity, him, but it's yeah. deep. It goes deeper than people just being sensitive. I think the problem is with people feigning offense and sensitivity when in reality they're just bullies. And commenting on this, like he's been talking about this for years, but I think that maybe now it's become a left versus right issue, whereas before it would be about who's offended and not putting a political label on it necessarily. Mm-hmm. Like back then, it would have just been. It wouldn't have been about the left is killing comedy. It would have been like, oh, look at these sensitive millennials who can't take a joke. Right. Right. Like there's a difference there. It's just that now that's identified as being of one political party, whether that's true or not. I think both sides get very offended when you say the wrong thing about people they like. The people who are ruining comedy, in my opinion, are women who can't stop talking about their vaginas, first of all. Second of all, activists. Yes. who put you on blast if you tell a joke that offends them or that they want to pretend offends them. And, and Most he, of it is pretend offense. He is right in one thing. Like they, they kind of tell on themselves by the amount of think pieces were written about why he's wrong, all from left-wing outlets, which kind of proves his point. Yeah. The, the guy, did you see the one from The Guardian where the guy looks exactly like what you imagine the headline would look like? The Guardian does their authors yeah. so dirty because the they put the picture yeah. of them right and, and there. And it's just like, he's like, this is why Jerry Seinfeld is wrong about comedy being dead. Yeah. And the pictures of him like this. Yep. They always uh, do the, l- let's listen to the his arms clip. crossed. Let's listen to his clip on this podcast where he okay. talks about what was going on here. Nothing really affects comedy. People always need it. They need it uh, so badly. And they don't get it. It used to be you would go home at the end of the day. Most people would go, oh, Cheers is on. Oh, MASH is on. Oh, Mary Tyler Moore is on. All in the family's on. 
You just expect that there'll be some funny stuff we can watch on TV tonight. Well, guess what? Where is it? This is the result of the extreme left and PC crap and people worrying so much about offending other people. Mm -hmm. When you write a script and it goes into four or five different hands, committees, groups, here's our thought about this joke, well, that's the end of your comedy. They move the gates, like in skiing. Yeah. Culture, the gates are moving. Your job is to be agile and clever enough that wherever they put the gates, I'm going to make the gate. He is right about the committees. He is right about when you make a movie now and these things, first of all, during the strike, they were talking about the amount of writers they wanted in a room, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to write by committee, almost by default now, when writing a script. Uh, the dude who directed Joker talked about how he can't do comedies anymore because it's just, it's just not possible. And so he went into Joker. Yeah. Right. That's that's not unheard of these days. And for the most part, at the Hollywood level, when you're making something that's going to supposedly go to a theater and cost 50 to 100 to 150 million dollars to make. And we're talking about the budgets are ballooning these days. Why would a comedy cost that much to make anyways? They're going to be like, well, at the corporate level, they don't know how to do it any other way. They don't know how to just hand it to a dude and let him make it. They think that the best way to do this would be corporate bureaucracy and all sorts of um, fail safes, which ends up being the problem, not the solution. Honestly, I'm not entirely convinced that writing by committee is to blame here because as long as it's a committee of uh, mainly men and... Um, but that's not what it means in Hollywood. What it means is a diverse well, group look, of the people... Problem, the problem starts when you bring women into the committee. That's the problem, right? I mean, it doesn't like, just have to be that. It could be somebody who's offended no, by the racial terms of the No, joke. if you're easily offended and you're a man... In, if you're an easily offended man in a group of other men, mm -hmm. there is no way you're about to put your neck out on the line to be like, um, actually, like, we should actually change that line or we should we should maybe replace that line with something else that's less I believe offensive. That there like, is a man beta doesn't want it doesn't to happen. humiliate himself in front of other men. It's, a, it's the truth. But if there are women in the room, it completely changes the dynamic of a dinner party, a workplace, mm -hmm. or a writing committee. It changes the dynamic. It does. And I think including women in these committees mm -hmm. is actually a huge part of the problem, which a lot of people don't want to talk about because, again, it's mean. The men in Hollywood are every bit as whiny as the women, so I don't think that actually... But the women are there. making the men more effeminate. If there are three or... F <laughs> so if you're in a committee room and it's, and it's more than one dude who says, that pissed me off, that upset me, and everybody else is terrified of saying, oh, you don't have a right to be upset about this, it's just a joke, it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman, they're going to whine and it's going to it's cause... Not in a in man, I don't even think it's in a man's nature to like be offended oh, like I that. Do. No, I, I believe no, that the these people who days, get jobs the in Hollywood, effeminate, yes, I do. The effeminate people in Hollywood, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe the effeminate men who are running Hollywood right now. Well, yeah, that's what I'm but talking about But in the right 80s, now. in the 90s, before we had quotas that forced mm -hmm. women into these committees and into these rooms, um, I genuinely don't think that that was a problem. I really yeah, don't. Yeah, but I, I'm talking about now. It's not, I, I'm, I'm saying now. like, Men start acting like that when women are involved in the dynamic, and it totally changes the way that men act. I, I, it's I, like ruining funny men by like including women in the conversation, honestly. And like, when that's it wouldn't matter my anyways, hypothesis. Even if, it's, even if it's not the writers, you're going to have people who work in HR, you're going to have people who work in standards and practices, you're going to have executives that will be women either way, or men that are just afraid of risk or taking a risk on a script like this or on, on some type of script that takes, you know, some shots at people. I, I know the conversation went off into all directions about who you're allowed to offend and who you're not allowed mm -hmm. to offend. I believe that the men in Hollywood now, maybe not in the 80s, 90s, or early 2000s, but the men that are getting these jobs in Hollywood writing now, because we're not in the age where meritocracy rules and the people who make it from movie to movie get there by basis of this was my last project, this was successful. They're dropped in there. They're saying we need six writers. And even if all six of those writers are men, and I don't believe that that's going to happen most of the time anyways, a lot of these guys are going to be coming out of writing programs in the 2010s at universities yeah. that are going to be just as whiny but and just as offended. The Look, I'm just saying that's the way that men will act in a gynocracy. That mm. is not the way men act. That is not who men are. It's not in a man's nature to be like, mm, 
actually, that joke was really hurtful to my community. A man wouldn't do that. I yeah. think that a woman is capable of entering a situation, entering an environment of men, and completely altering the dynamic for the worse, which is why men's spaces should have never been disturbed in the first place and like basically turned into the longhouse. That's what it is. That's the longhouse right there. It completely changes the way that men act. There's and so much not only that, but women despise the men for bending to their will at the same time as they are, you know, calling the shots. It's just it's really sick. I don't it's see toxic. this right here as a, as a gendered issue as much as I see it as a, a Hollywood ideological issue where they are so terrified of making jokes at the expense of anyone from a, a minority represented group that they can't do it. And even when the people in that group make the joke, then a white guy or a white lady is offended on their behalf. We've got a $20 from Known Undesirable. He said, here's 20 to shut Mary up. Okay, Brett, you read the rest one. The uh, next one. He says, uh, Francisco Sanchez Jr. says, George Lucas was cucked back when he made Star Wars. Uh, well, I mean, a, a lot of people would make the argument that when he made the prequel trilogy that he didn't have anyone telling him no and that he should have probably had somebody to be like, hey, maybe you need to reel back on some of these ideas. But that's a discussion for the... The actual big Star Wars fans, which is not I. I just, I look at committee writing and it's just one of those things that man or woman, like there's a reason Tina Fey is successful. But also like, think of like, you get a room together and it's you and one or two other people. I, I'm the same way about directing that if I start seeing five, six names on a script the same way I feel when I see two directors on a film, I'm already suspicious. How can you go through something like that without it being sanitized? Because each one of these people is going to find something about it that needs to be changed. Because a movie's not supposed to be the vision of five or six people. It's supposed to be a story told by a small group who are all working towards a common goal. You can't get six people in the room on a regular basis and find that you're all working towards a common goal that's actually going to come out anything like what it was supposed to be when it was initially conceived. Well, the union forces that, unfortunately. But, yep. uh, and a lot of internal company policies as yep. well. Um, but yeah, I think that he's just expressing what a lot of people are dealing with, which is when they watch a show that they used to like and they, they see an episode or they see a joke and they're like, they would never make that today. Mm -hmm. Literally everyone says that and they say it because it's true. And that means that something has gone horribly wrong. There's another Francisco 20 Francisco Sanchez Jr. said, Mary can talk now. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yep. I just, I don't see these problems changing because the, the restrictions are only going to become more prevalent and all of the roadblocks that they put in to get stuff made are only going to become more severe, not less. They're not going to take the shackles off because they're taking the risk. So the Hollywood machine... The, 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 the non-creatives are always going to think more bureaucracy is the right answer when everyone knows that that's really not it. Thanks for watching. Listen to full episodes of Pop Culture Crisis on Spotify. Keep up with us on social media and make sure you subscribe and ring that bell so you never miss the show. Bye, guys.